Francie, thank you so much for joining me on the Girl Defined show. I am a huge fan, and anyone who follows me or Girl Defined probably knows that I am such a huge fan of you and Heaven in Your Home, your podcast and your ministry, and just everything you do to help married women and single women thrive in God's incredible design for their sexuality and for their marriage and all of that. But for the few who may not know you, can you just share a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you're from, your family, all the things? Yeah, so I am a mother of six. My husband and I live with our kiddos right outside of Washington, D.C. And so it's a busy time of life. Our oldest is 14, almost 15, and our youngest is four. And so we're just doing all the things. I'm like a professional Uber driver that doesn't get tipped, doesn't get paid. I like, you know, get paid in hugs. And I appreciate that, especially my teenagers. Um, it's a sweet, it's a sweet stage of a lot of activity, but in my windows of free time, I really get a lot of life from doing the podcast called Heaven in Your Home, that um, where we talk about sex, marriage, and the mission of God, and how it's all feeds into the big picture of God's heart to bring heaven to earth that our bodies have meaning, that our bodies are theological, our gender has meaning, and that actually married sex is a really powerful supernatural gift. And it's kind of my journey. I'm not a sex therapist. I'm not a counselor. I'm just a wife and a mom and really a lover of Jesus who has been on this journey to find his heart in this and um, realizing that he's actually calling me to do this more. And so I'm trying to say yes to him. This was not my dream. I didn't always think I'd be in this conversation, but it has definitely been um, a sweet journey because I've seen him healing me and I've seen him healing others just by speaking his truth. Because the truth really does set us free. So. Mm -hmm. so give us a little glimpse of you and your husband, like your marriage, your sex life, because you've been very open on heaven in your home, kind of like that journey. So can you give us the snapshot of kind of where you were when you first got married and where you are today and just the growth that's taken place? Yeah. So um, oddly enough, when I look back at my story, I realized, wow, God was writing a story because I was in high school and just really decided I want to be captivated by Jesus. It was really him asking me, will you be captivated by me more than anything else? And of course, I had like a really cute high school boyfriend who was in a Christian band and <laughs> he was like, what's captivated your heart? What do you think about when you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed at night? And I'm like, it's him. Yes. And the Lord was like, I want to be that. And so my journey with having a wholehearted love for Jesus started young and bled into my sexuality because I realized I'm going to give this boy to God and I'm going to follow him and I'm going to let go of him and I'm going to give Jesus my whole heart. And so it was right in the purity culture and I was for sure raised in the thick of the purity culture, but I don't yeah. think that, um, I think it was more just the silence. And so when I got married at a very young age, at age 20, it had been wow. kind of just... Yeah, I was 20. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it was the theme. And when I got married or it came to get married, I'm like, I got to do it. And I don't know how to do it because I had just shut it down for so long. And I don't know, not only know how to do it, but I not know how to do it. I don't know how to think about it, which yes. was probably more of the barrier um, was I had just kind of disintegrated myself, disconnected myself from my body and my femininity because I thought it was a little bit dangerous or a little yeah. bit of a, a stronghold for others, for guys, for me. And I really just wanted to love Jesus. And so I thought I'd love him with my whole heart, but what about my body? And what about my genitals? And what about my femininity? And what about nakedness? How do I find God in that? And how do I be okay with that? Because um, it had been such a non-conversation. So I think that was where I started. It required a lot of inner healing work, honestly, a lot of work with the Holy Spirit to identify lies that I had believed about my body, uh, places where I was really agreeing with shame rather than God's proclamation that you are good, your body is good, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I had to figure out what I was agreeing with in my heart and um, took a lot of work to be able to press into God in that and also to share that with Wyatt. And we ended up realizing that um, sex was a big deal to him. He was a division one athlete. So he had like lots of testosterone at that wow, time. It was like, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was a D1 basketball player. Wow. And so he kind of had this fear of like, I hope I'm not too much for her. Like what if, because he was aiming for purity, he was really trying to 
um, hold on tight for marriage and God had redeemed his past. And so he was knew the power of a sex drive, but also was a little bit scared of like, is this going to be too much for my wife? I don't want to overwhelm her or stress her out with what feels like such a real physical need or desire. And we can talk about need later, but um, that was kind of where we started. And so we ended up spending a lot of time on our pink inner healing couch, which if you listen to episode one in my podcast, I tell this whole story, but just asking God, Lord, come in where he's afraid, where I'm afraid, where he's insecure, where I'm insecure. And so it was months of allowing God to sift through the issues of our heart, lots of repentance, lots of uh, uprooting lies and asking God to plant seeds of truth in those places. And then I think what was powerful is that we didn't just stop on the couch to pray. We went to the bedroom and we made what was spiritual in our relationship physical. So the spiritual oneness we were experiencing, we then went and made love. And it was a compound effect that we realized there's so much power in oneness. And nobody had told us that. We had kind of heard it's a man's need and um, in indirectly kind of it's a woman's duty. And we we're trying to figure that out. But it was like God was blowing us out of the water with a better story wow. and reminding us there's a better story here than a man's need and a woman's duty. There's a, a higher narrative. There's a more beautiful picture. And there's actually a tangible goodness that happens in your home when a husband and a wife pursue oneness and self-giving love and mutual pleasure. And there is something of a heaven and earth overlap that happens. And so that was kind of our journey. We were sniffing that out the first few years, realizing there's something powerful here. We were having a lot of sex. We were realizing the more, the more, the more we were pursuing this intimacy, spiritually and physically, there was a sense, a thin place of heaven and earth in our room, in our home, in our connection. It's like coffee pot tenderness, this goodness. And um, it kind of reset all of those old patterns. And from then I got really deep into studying the theology of this and then the physiological nature of sex and all of the stuff. So that was that was where we began. And wow. we are um, 17 years into marriage and it just keeps getting better. It, the orgasms get better, the freedom gets better, the surrender, the trust. Um, and the power of it, the power of it to be like a high, high and like so fun and passionate. And we've known low times that are so low and we're so broken and we've had physical sickness. We've had trauma in our home and sex has been a gift in all of those things. It's been there when we've been unwell, when we've been well, when we've needed comfort, when we've been celebrating, when we've been like both have COVID and cough drops in our mouths and we're like, we're going to glue ourselves together. Like in the hard times and when real life hits, Sex has been a powerful gift to be able to remind us of that garden dream in Genesis 1 that God places image on the body of a male and female, commanded them, be fruitful, multiply, and take dominion from a place of oneness and unity and love. And so our fruitfulness as parents, as disciple makers in the world, as workers, whatever we're doing has a lot to do with our pursuit in our home of unity and oneness. And so it's in the highs and the lows, and there's just so much fruit with it and so much evidence of God's goodness through it. And just hearing you talk, I'm like, yes, you know, the way you talk so freely and openly, like I'm used to it now because I've listened to like yeah. probably every single one of your episodes, you know, every single one of your episodes on your heaven in your home podcast. And anyone I talk to who's like getting married or about to get married, I'm like, you have to start with episode one and listen all the way through. But just hearing, mm-hmm. you know, you talk so freely about sex and the body and the spiritual and all of that. I know it's getting more common for Christians to speak in that way, but you know, before I found your podcast, honestly, I hadn't heard like a Christian married woman speak so honestly and freely and bring in all of the beautiful aspects, like the emotions and the body and the hard times and the great times and all all of that. And so I know the sisterhood right now, as they're listening, they're like, whoa, you know, this is amazing. And they actually mm-hmm. submitted a ton of questions for you. And we could okay. literally talk for, you know, five hours about all these, but I tried to pick the ones that kept coming up. So different people were asking the same ones and you are the perfect person to answer these questions. Cause they are very direct. They are very open and they're all anonymous. So they were able to ask them no names attached. And I know these apply to a lot of women. So we are actually going to jump in and get your wisdom on some of these questions. So question number one that we got from one of the girl Defined sisterhood members, she says, where did my libido go? The second I got married, I was a virgin. And I re- I'm like, 
Yes. Like why you hear that, that happens. Like, oh, I have this super high sex drive and then I get married and I'm like, okay, I never want this again. So what's your take on that? That breaks my heart. I, because it's so common and especially I think sadly, maybe in the Christian world, there's a few things happening. I think one is, um, we kind of have this narrative, like if you wait, then it will be great. And so it's kind of setting you up for something that may not be realistic because newlywed sex is not as great as 10 years in, as 20 years in, you know, if you keep growing because you keep growing in trust, in yeah. vulnerability, in healing. And those are the things that are required for great sex. You have to have trust. You have to be able to be naked and unashamed. You have to be able to articulate what it is that you're really afraid of and that other person can know you in that place. That's intimacy. And then sex is a type of intimacy that complements that and makes that even better. So all that to say, just knowing, okay, having a great sex life is a process and it's not going to be like the best sex you've ever imagined and can ever have the first night or even the first month or the first year. Because I remember also as a newlywed things started coming up right after the wedding. I'm like, whoa, who did I marry? Why did I do this? <laughs> you know, like, what What did I just do? Because suddenly it is just so vulnerable and you realize I have nothing in between me and this person and our hearts are laid bare. And so we ran to Jesus. I'm not sure what you do if you don't run to Jesus, yeah. but we ran to Jesus to help us navigate that and for him to be our covering together. But back to what happened in my Lido, the second, libido the second I get married, I think one of the things we do when we date is we make out and we have passionate like fondling or whatever line you have drawn. Yeah. You feel lots of arousal because you can't go all the way. And so you're doing all these other things that your body actually needs for arousal. Your body needs time for arousal. It needs kissing. It needs some neck kissing. It needs some caressing. It needs time for your um, vagina to lubricate. It needs time for um, blood flow to come into your genitals so that you open up and you soften and you um, are ready for entry and you have that desire of like, I want you in me. Yes. Okay. We're just going to be right on there. Yes. So that is the feeling when you're making out and you have a lot of floor foreplay. But sometimes I feel like when we get married, it's almost like we just switch for all of that and we just go for sex. And we're like, well, that's kind of elementary. And now we just got to go have sex. And if we lose all that foreplay and all of that fun intimacy before, and then we suddenly are just like all about the deed we're sometimes not giving our body what it actually had been getting earlier and was ready and aroused. We need to kind of incorporate all of that. I think that's one big part of it. I think another part is just being able to be open and honest with where you are and know that it's a process and have expectations lowered a little bit, that it's not going to be the best thing you've ever experienced the first time because you're learning something new. Yes. Um, and I think also just the process of getting to know what feels good yes. and you're not going to be able to read each other's minds. And so if you have kind of a, eh, that was not that great. No, that's totally fine. And that's totally normal. You get to grow it. And I think yes. that's one thing I emphasize a lot in my podcast is the gift of growing your sex life. It is not an automatic. It's something that requires work and it requires getting to know your body and sometimes that takes some, some practice to get to know your body and what feels good and also how to communicate what feels good. And so that's part of the joy of it is that you get to grow. It's not an automatic thing. Yeah. Okay. So I have to ask because you said get to know your body and that I'm telling you, like, until I heard you talk about that, I've been married for four years until I heard you talk about that. I just thought like, okay, that is like terrible. You would never, like, how do you even get to know your body? What is that? Like, no, 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 you know? So can you explain yeah. what you're talking about and how that can be helpful? Yes. Okay. So, um, I, again, I'm not a counselor. I'm not a sex therapist. I'm just going to tell you my story. So my journey, I, I like, I'll just be your big sister and we can yes, just, you know, we need that. <laughs> Yeah, sift through it and um, say, talk, talk to your pastor, but maybe not talk to your pastor. I'm going to give you some good resources afterwards that yeah. will back up what I'm saying. But anyway, I think, so here's the breakdown is that we spend a lot of years believing that masturbation is wrong. And so any self-touching is wrong. Don't do it. And there yeah. is no scripture mm -hmm. A that says masturbation is wrong. However, there are lots of reasons to be very cautious about what it is to be involved in that act. And so that is for another conversation. But I think self-cultivation is what I like to call it, is different than masturbation. Masturbation is touching for like for stimulus and for orgasm by yourself, for yourself, in a secretive, isolated way. 
self-cultivation is a way to get to know your feminine body so that a you love it and you think it's good and you like it and you're comfortable with it and you are aware of it and you're educated about what is where and what is down there i had no education about my body no idea what was down there i mean i hear a lot of women get married they're like i didn't know i had a clitoris the husband yeah. doesn't know and so if you don't know about your body it's hard to be able to share your body it's kind of like you have a really special gift but it just stays in the corner and you never even opened it and so you you can't really share it with anyone because you were too scared of it mm. and your body is a gift and God has given it to us and we don't have to be scared of it. And so self-cultivation is simply just kind of like self-education. You can think of it that way, getting to know your body. You can touch yourself down there in order to be like, okay, this stroke, this way feels good. And then the point is then you go teach your husband. Yeah. But he can't read your mind. And yes. sometimes in the moment, there's a little bit of like awkwardness and um, it's sometimes a blessing to him. And this is something you can talk about with your husband. It's not something you do secretly or alone, but self-cultivation is just a word that I like. It's kind of gentle and beautiful. And it's a way to cultivate growth and to cultivate a reality that your body is good and to come into alignment with that. And it is a good gift that you don't need to be scared of. And so I think that, um, I think even just, yeah, I think just practicing, sometimes I found a lot of comfort in just being in the bathroom alone, like taking a bath or a shower and just even blessing my body while I'm bathing. And thank you, God, for my beautiful body and all the ways that it serves me and my family, my arms that hold babies, my breasts that have fed babies, my tummy that's carried, you know, and even if you haven't had babies, your body is working to serve others. Your body is working to glorify God all the time and your hands are serving, your feet are serving. And sometimes I think we just feel really disconnected from a few parts of our body that we're afraid of. And so if you can get in the shower and bless your body and say, God, thank you for the beauty of this body. That's another step into getting to know your body is even to come into agreement with the fact that it's good. Now I know that will blow some people's minds because that was like the big, you know, all of what you just described to, for me for probably even like, you know, the first three years of my marriage, it was like, Oh no, 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 You know? And so when I started listening to you and then just digging deeper and digging into resources you recommended, that has been such a helpful practice and just a way to not like, okay, I'm just gonna, I go into, you know, the bedroom and here are the things that I'm like this robot. It's like, no, like I am a body and I have these beautiful aspects of me and I have so much to offer and I have so much to bring. And I don't just even have to wait for him to like, okay, know everything. And okay, he better touch me here and he'd better touch me there. And oh, now he doesn't know what to do. You know, it's like, I can bring mm -hmm. so much there and so much just confidence and more security and even more of my own like eroticism. Like I have something to bring and this is a good thing. So yeah. I'm really, really glad you touched on that. I do have another question though, that I, I honestly have no idea what you're going to say to this. I okay. have thought about this, but I, I don't know. I mean, I've only been married for four years. Like I said, <laughs> you've got a lot more years on me. So someone asked about sex toys and intimacy in long distance marriages, specifically a military wife. Her husband is serving overseas. I've wondered about this and she wonders too, like, are there rules? Are there guidelines? How does that work? Okay. So when we, we as Christians are dying for permission about everything. And I, I think I heard somebody say that like, it's true. Like, is this okay? Is this okay? I don't know. We're so afraid. We're so afraid. And I just want to even encourage you to bring that to the Lord. Lord, I'm so afraid of getting it wrong. I'm so afraid of sinning or messing up and just have a conversation with Jesus, first of all, because I, like our friend Julie Slattery talks about, like, I don't want to tell you what to think. I want to, I want to hopefully inspire you how to think or how to engage with God regarding your body and your sexuality, because he is your God. He is your maker. And if you are in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you to discern with you. So that being said, we know from first Corinthians 10 that all things are permissible. Not all things are beneficial. I think that's a Holy Spirit conversation. Lord, is this beneficial for our marriage? Does this help us gain intimacy? Mm. Is this violating any of the scriptural principles like being outside of a husband and a wife? Like no other people need to be involved. That's obviously a no-no. And then everybody, I feel like at this point, it's very common sense that pornography is like poison. Like that is yeah. not wise, 100%. That was um, never God's intention to be 
you know, encountering sexuality outside of your covenant. And also it's just terrible for your brain. It's terrible for your sexual response. It's bad on every count. So all those things said, let's think about sex toys. And um, I'll just tell you, Bethany, you might be getting free by listening to me, but I find other women who are freer than me. And I'm like leaning towards them because I yes. still have a ways to go on my freedom journey. But I interviewed a woman uh, recently named Phyllis Hill. Phyllis and Glenn Hill, they run a ministry called Connection Codes, and she's got more freedom than me. So you can look at her because I was yes. like, love her wisdom. And we were talking about this very thing about sex toys. Yeah. And she was like, crazy, think about it. And I can share with you my personal journey too. But she's like, think about it as sex tools instead of mm. sex toys. I think of, we think of sex toys and we think like, eh, like maybe immoral or kinky yeah. or something that we're just casting judgment on. Yeah. But the truth is like, we can be really creative and we can have lots of fun in the bedroom. Yeah. And as long as it is mutual and we're both enjoying it and it's building intimacy, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Like you do what is honoring and loving and connecting for your union. And it may not be the same thing that somebody else would enjoy, but there's no shame in trying. And I'm gonna give you some examples of sex yeah. tools that might be um, an on-ramp. Uh, sometimes changing your position is really helpful in whether you're pregnant or whether you are um, just wanting some variety or trying different positions for lots of reasons. There's no rule on positions. You try a million positions, it's so fun. To try it's to not like the one godly position. It's you know, not one godly. Like the position. most spiritual. <laughs> yeah, there's not a spiritual position. All of it is spiritual. God loves all of it. He made our bodies amazing and hilarious and fun and <laughs> adventurous. Um, but sometimes your hips can sink if like you're trying to prop your hips up. So there is a sex pillow called the Liberator Wedge. And so it's technically a sex toy, but it is really helpful because it props your hips up and it, you stay in that position. And yeah. it is awesome because you're suddenly like, whoa, I can feel the stuff I've never felt before because your hips yeah. are in a different position. And you might even be able to get closer depending on your size. Like some, my husband's like 6'3 and I'm 5'5. Five, five. So, you know, and yes. it's just helpful to have yeah. different options for different positions. Um, so a sex pillow, vibrators are a common conversation. There's nothing immoral or illegal about vibrators. I will say this. Yeah. I did not use a vibrator for 15 years of our marriage. Mm -hmm. It has been introduced to our marriage at this point. I really appreciate it, but it is yeah. a tool and it's not the only way we connect. Yeah. Um, I'm glad personally, I didn't use one for a long time because of this. It gave us time to learn each other. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a vibrator can kind of skip a step because it is really powerful and it doesn't require him to learn what feels good or how to bring you yeah. to orgasm. And it doesn't require you to know your body because it does the work for you. And it kind of takes, it just is one step removed. Um, and so I would say vibrators are amazing if you've been married for a long time and you haven't reached orgasm, they can help you figure out a little bit more of the mechanics. Maybe there was um, just a little bit of help needed there. We introduced a vibrator in a time of, of deep sickness. And so we needed a bit of variety to yeah. be able to enjoy more intimacy. And it's been a tool that I like, but you could try any sex tool and keep it forever, keep it for one time. There's a lot of cheap things out there that are not that really, really not that great or effective, but could be fun. Um, and so I think we don't have to be afraid. And if you are afraid, talk to the Lord and talk to a trusted friend and say, where's this fear stemming from? Because I think that's the bigger conversation is why am I so afraid? Mm. And is there shame or fear at work in my relationship with my body and my marriage and my sex life? Because it is not meant, it's not meant to be a place where fear and shame are. And if they are there, that's totally fine. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes in and illumines and it's part of us being in touch with our sexual story. And that's so big in terms of walking in the fullness is we have to know, like, where did I come from and why do I believe what I believe and what informed me and what experiences actually really shaped me, whether it was from the world or my wounds or, yeah. It's, I mean, everything you're saying, it's like I 100% relate to just the wanting permission and wanting, like, tell me what's okay, tell me what's not okay, you know, and I just love the way you change the language, like even sex toys to sex tools, like it totally changes the entire perspective and outlook like, Oh, I can actually make these decisions and I can like, we can be prayerful about this for ourselves. Like, uh, it's just common sense in so many ways that is extremely helpful. You did mention illness and using a vibrator during that time. Someone had a specific question about how to deal with like a low libido and just like sexual, like disconnect during an illness. So with, you know, in your experience and having walked through that, how did you stay connected and pursue sexual like intimacy during that time? Yeah. 
Well, there are lots of types of illnesses that can affect sex life, your sex life in a lot of different ways. And I will just say that um, sometimes I think we have minimized um, what we define sex as one act, the P and the V, if you know what I mean, like that is sex, but the yeah. sexual intimacy can look like a lot of things. Let's say you're on pelvic rest and you are having a baby and you are struggling and you can't, I don't know if that's your story or not. I know you're getting ready to have a baby, but many people well, are so on so much tearing with my first one and it was a whole experience. So yeah. Right. Right. And so maybe post postpartum or maybe in your pregnancy, you can't have sex or whatever, but yeah. how do you stay sexually intimate? Well, you have like head to toe access, like your whole body is beautiful and women have 11 or more erogenous zones all throughout their whole body. If you haven't listened to my um, series on your wonderful female body, I did like a bunch of sessions this summer because I just kept going. I'm like, our bodies are so amazing. So good. Oh, and so, yeah, it's amazing. Like, I talk about erogenous zones in that one and think about creatively, how can we express sexual love, like this naked and unashamed love that we have that only we share in this season if yeah. there's illness. So it may be that a husband is unable to have an erection. There might be some medical problems. There might be depression, anxiety. If he's on medicine for that, that could be a problem. In that case, you might want to like, hey, we're gonna stimulate each other in different ways or yeah. you, he can stimulate you and that can be very gratifying for him because he doesn't feel like he's a failure or you can give each other sensual massages. So I would say always trying to find ways to stay sexually connected mm -hmm. because there are so many um, hormones that have Happen even through our body by God's good design of oxytocin and dopamine and vasopressin, which all are bonding hormones and make you feel close to your spouse. And I'm not even joking, like we've been sick this whole semester of just common colds, viruses, flus. Oh. It's it's just the viral load in our house is so thick, you just don't even want to come over. <laughs> Having six kids, it doesn't stop. But we, we laugh. We're like, we have cough drops in our mouth, but we are having we're being intimate because we we fight for it because it's about connection. It's not about a sexual release necessarily. It's not about a check mark on our calendar because we should. We choose connection because of how it shifts the atmosphere of our relationship and our home. And so even in seasons of illness where we weren't able to do exactly everything we used to do, we found ways to be sexually intimate because it matters to our connection and it bears fruit in terms of our grace for each other, our softness to each other, even our ability to emotionally connect is often enhanced by sexual connection that we've had because it, it feeds on each other. It's not one above the other. It's all connected. And in a marriage specifically, there's so many things pulling at you. You can always be talking about the kids, the schedule, the bills, but this sexual connection kind of turns out, like dims all those other things and the lights come up on love and closeness. And that is powerful, especially in a season of illness when you need that, you need that comfort and that closeness. So I would just say, think outside of the box, um, know that there are a lot of ways to be sexually intimate, get good at doing hand jobs on each other and using your whole bodies to be yes. able to say, I love you. We are together in this and we are expressing love and pleasure in the best way we can right now. And this mm -hmm. probably won't be forever, but we're leaning into connection now. Yeah, that's so good. Okay, specifically, let's jump into orgasms because that I feel like is, especially in Christian circles, nobody wants to say that word. And even people who will like DM me or even, you know, post this in the question box, they, it's like, ah, you know, like, I don't want to say this, but I, I do want to ask about this. And even as someone who just got married four years ago, and I felt like I did have access to a lot of good resources, I look back and I'm like, there was so little talk about this. And even in some of the married women I talked to, it's like the orgasm conversation was just like, okay, that's, we just don't talk about that. And so I appreciate mm -hmm. the women who have asked specific questions about this. One asked how to learn to orgasm and feel more pleasure. She's feeling the connection with her husband, maybe that emotional connection or spiritual connection, but that physical like uh, pleasure, she's just not experiencing. So for the woman who has never had an orgasm, how can you learn that? And how do you even know what to look for? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I will give you some of my tips, but I'm going to give you a book straight up right now. Yes, this is you. called Unlock Your Orgasm by Bonnie Burns. She's one of the women on the Christian sex, Christian sex chat. Uh, okay. Do you know that book? Chris, uh, that no. website, Christian sex chat. Um, anyway, it's like four or five. I think they're older women and it, I appreciate it so wow. much. That's Christian awesome. sex chat. I think is what it's called. Anyway, it's a podcast and she's one of the authors. She has tons of wisdom and um, I've just appreciated that book so much because it is taking you from pre-orgasmic to yes. orgasmic. 
And so if you don't know anything, it really begins with learning about your body. It really does. It begins with your mindset. It begins with understanding, A, you have to come into agreement with your body is good because our bodies are connected to our brains and our brains inform our bodies of what to do. And then our bodies also inform our brains. And so it's this, it's this cycle of if we're tense and if we're tight and if we're afraid and anxious, our brains are going to shut down and we'll be anxious. And so even just taking some deep breaths, doing a few Kegels to kind of get blood flow to your genitals, realizing, okay, this body is good. If you do a Kegel, if you don't know what that is, it's when you're peeing and you stop midstream and you hold your pee in for a second. That's the motion of a Kegel. An orgasm is like a really fast series of those. And it's so fast. Those contractions are so fast that you feel a ton of pleasure. It's kind of funny. You think of like vaginal contractions when you're having a baby. That does not feel good. But there's a lot of other things happening. But the contraction is the fast. It's like ultra fast squeezing of those muscles. And then also stimulation of your clitoris that is attached to thousands of nerve endings. It is recent. And this is not just a Christian thing, Bethany. The world doesn't talk about women's sexual health. And the New York Times came out with an article just this fall that was like, the clitoris has been rediscovered. Basically, even the worldly doctors, all the studies, mostly sexual studies have been done on men, very little, if any, sexual studies on women and even the clitoris. And so there's been new studies done and it shows there used to be 8,000 nerve endings. Now there's realized 10,000 nerve endings in the clitoris. A man's penis has 4,000 nerve endings. So the good news is, and the good news of how God designed you as a pinnacle of creation, as a woman in the garden who was called Eve, life-giving, beautiful woman, you have so much capacity for pleasure. It's actually unending. There, there was a study that was done where a woman was able to orgasm. This is might really overwhelm people for like 11 hours. Okay. <laughs> the point wow. of that just stopped because she got tired. The point of that is to tell you there is not a limit to how much pleasure you can have. Our good God designed you that way. Women are able to have multiple orgasms, which means like you climax and then you take a few minutes and you do it again and you do You could go on and on and on. That is the generosity of God and how much goodness there is for you. All that said, it's worth taking the time to learn your body because you were designed to receive that. And I just have to throw this in, this theology of the body, our body and our anatomy declares something true about us that reflects even God because we're image bearers. Our body shows that we are made to receive. And if you're not sure about that, think about the shape of your vagina. Your body is made to receive. It's made to receive seeds of life. It's made to receive pleasure. And so it's part of your God-given um, blessing that you're made to receive pleasure. It's part of a husband's God-given blessing that he's made strong and to pursue and to initiate. And so sp- sometimes I think women struggle with receiving and just unwinding and knowing this is actually a gift to my husband that I get to receive. And so I think if you're wondering about how to become orgasmic, read that book, Unlock Your Orgasm, because that really, it will give you, I think in the privacy of your home, home like the courage to get out a mirror and look down there, get to know your body, get to know that it's good, get to know your anatomy and begin to be able to even verbalize that to your husband. And there's exercises in there on how to um, activate those feelings and how to find positions that feel good, how to communicate what you might want to do with your husband. And it's just a process. But I think I just want to mostly give hope. I can't break down like the 10 steps of becoming orgasmic right here, but there's so much hope because it's what your body was made for. And a lot of it has to do with our mindset And are we integrating our bodies with a sense of you're good and I want to receive and I'm open. And then it's, it's training yourself and training your husband to know because it doesn't always happen automatically. And some women think, oh, is it just vaginal? Because I think we think that thrusting and ejaculation is sex and it's supposed to be a boom, like explosion. That's what the movies show. But no, women need external stimulation. They need arousal. They need time. And so it is a little bit more of a process but it's really good. And it's a blessing to your husband to be able to explore that with him. Mm -hmm. Well, and you've, I mean, you've talked so openly about this on your podcast. It was interesting actually last year. I don't even remember the name of the movie, but it's like some super popular Christmas movie. And (laughs) I didn't actually really even, I didn't really like it, but at one point, you know, they don't show anything, but it's like the, you know, the girl and the guy and he comes over and they're like going to go upstairs and whatever. And she, he asked her, you know, Oh, do you like, you know, foreplay? And she's like, oh, I hate foreplay or whatever. Like, I just want to jump right in it. And I'm like, okay, this is part of the problem of just like, 
I don't know, like women, you just basically jump in and you're like, you know, whoa, having all these orgasms. And it's like, you feel as someone who doesn't necessarily, hasn't experienced that you see even just like a small or hear a small line like that in a movie. And you're like, wow, I must be like so broken. Something must be so wrong with me. And it just contributes to the problem because now mentally there's so much anxiety and so many issues. And so I would really encourage our listeners to go to Francie's podcast, Heaven in Your Home. Obviously, we'll link it all, but you have several um, episodes that specifically talk about like your orgasmic potential and just how the process, you know, of reaching an orgasm and how that looks. Um, I think this is probably one of the most (laughs) asked questions and women, married women want to know about like having an orgasm the most because they feel like that's the thing that's talked about the least. Um, Mm -hmm. So kind of building on that, why would you say it is so hard for a woman to have an orgasm? Like, I don't know if that's really true, but that's how we feel. And we feel like it's hard to experience that. And a lot of women haven't ever even experienced that. Yeah. So as, as we're talking, I'm thinking about my real life and my real life is full of kids and full of demands. And I am straight up exhausted, right? I just told you, I had a free morning at home before we started recording. I'm like, I had a free morning at home. I had all these aspirations. I was going to work out. And you know what I did? I promptly got in my bed after I took my kids to their classes and I slept for an hour and a half and I set my alarm for 30 minutes and I still slept. That is, I think, true of a lot of women. If you have free time, what do you want to do? Like, really, our bodies need to sleep. We're really tired. So being exhausted, being distracted, which, oh, by the way, I'm always, you know, needing to be on Instagram or Amazon or doing something, not to mention social media. Like, our brains are always distracted. So we're exhausted, we're distracted, and we're so busy. All those things are really bad ingredients when you want to become orgasmic. Mm -hmm. Our bodies need to be rested. We need time in a bathtub to breathe, to feel our femininity, to take a deep breath. And it might feel like, oh, that's never in my lifetime, but it might help to communicate a few things like that. Hey, babe, it would really help me. And that couple that I mentioned, Glenn and Phyllis, they actually had a similar story as to me and Wyatt. I told Wyatt at one point, I'm like, I need a bath. I need alone time because I can't breathe. (laughs) And I can't switch from like being a giver all day to all the people to becoming like an orgasmic, excited wife five minutes later. And so I think there's some parts of it that are lifestyle changes of thinking, let me just care for my body. Let me go slower. Let me rest. Let me maybe put down my phone and pick up an actual novel and just relax into my body so that my brain can come down to a place of being able to receive. So I think that's a big part of it. Quickies are great ideas for busy weeks, but that's not the way to have great orgasms. Yeah. Slower, longer sessions when you have time to explore each other's bodies, to do foreplay, to really just unwind and be present in the moment, those are all real serious ingredients for becoming orgasmic that don't really have anything to do with your clitoris. We haven't even gotten to that. But I think going slower and giving yourself time, and you might also think, oh, that's crazy. Well, the way that my husband and I, who have a very full life, have done it is the last few years, we've opted for hotel dates. Um, (laughs) We don't even spend the night. But we go to the hotel from like four to eight or something like that in the afternoons. And we don't, so we're like home to put the kids in bed, but we need time together. And we often will take a nap, but then we'll just have time to shower slowly, to be present in the moment, to take turns on each other and really enjoy intimacy. And I think that's where our most powerful experiences have have happened is because we're going slowly Mm. and we're spreading out the pleasure and it's not done in two seconds and then it's over we're really taking our time. And as we have gotten to know each other, it's even more fun because we know how to extend the pleasure for each other. Mm, That's so beautiful. I know a big shift in our marriage um, came. (laughs) I don't, I think it was in a book or something, but you know, I, I think I used to come to like, okay, we're going to be intimate or whatever. And it would, I would basically view it like, all right, Dave, it's your job to make me come alive. And I'm like coming like these dead dry bones. And he's like, all right, how am I going to raise the dead tonight? You know, it was just so so horrible. And, you know, we had this massive shift of me, you know, and him just so many mindset shifts, but me realizing like, oh, I don't come as these dead dry bones, like just the things that you're describing. Like I can do things to prepare and to rest and to get mentally in this space, even physically, like appreciating my body, even thinking about what's going to happen, you know, like bringing out that 
like inner eroticism to the Absolutely. bedroom, you know, and thinking about like, oh, you know, lingerie, it's, it's not just for him. Like I can feel super sexy in this and that totally changes how I feel when I come into this moment. And so I know for us making some of those changes has been super, super helpful. Obviously we're still on the journey and I'm learning so much, um, but that's been super helpful for me. So if you are a woman out there who's, you know, the dead bones like me, <laughs> you know, yeah. not being the dead bones is a good idea. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a very real thing. I talked to my husband years ago. I'm like, it's like, I literally have to switch gears. I'm so tired. I've got baby spit up on my shoulder. You know, I haven't washed my hair in a week. I just don't feel cute. I don't feel pretty. And so it just all bleeds into your sex life. But I realized like, I need to switch gears from like the giving wife from the giving mom to the orgasmic wife. Like I have to figure out what is what is it that helps me realize I can be both, but not necessarily at the same time. Yeah. And within me is the power to be both, but I need some things. And so I do take a couple baths a week and Wyatt will put the little ones down. And then for a long time, we uh, practice date night every night. We call it that because it was like, we couldn't afford a big babysitter and we didn't have anybody nearby. So every night from eight to nine was our, our, our time set apart. And so we did that for many years until our kids got older and we had to switch things around with their schedule. But eight to nine was, and so I knew before eight, I wanted to be switching gears in my mind. And so I might go freshen up, you know, I had always had baby wipes nearby. So I'd like wipe down or take a quick shower and even just like putting a warm washcloth all over your body and in your private parts, it just kind of reminds you, oh, hi, I am capable of pleasure. And one of my like favorite secrets that's so tiny is buying cute underwear from like Target when it's on sale. And because I can easily wear underwear that has holes in it like every day of the week. And just like, who has time to go buy new underwear? But when I'm at Target and then I like buy a couple pairs, I realize like, whoa, I feel differently all day and nobody yes. knows except me. And so it's like an internal shift. And then I'm like, I can't wait to show, guess what? I got yes. new undies. And then it's like becomes a little playful thing and texting each other throughout the day and even scheduling sex. I know some people scoff at that, but it's so powerful because then yeah. if you know, okay, this week, this night, and this night, we're going to be intimate uh, that morning, I'm getting ready and yes. I am um, caring for my body in a different way. I'm probably hydrating. I'm going to exercise because yes. I'll get blood flow going. And so it's just being intentional to think about your sex life, intentional to prioritize it, to really um, focus on it. And even reading books like this Bonnie Burns orgasm book and telling your husband, babe, I'm reading, I'm learning. I can't wait to share with you what I'm learning. Bring him into it. It really is powerful. And just, you know, don't be ashamed of devouring resources about sex because yes. it is the most really i hate to say it but it's the most important part of a healthy marriage mm. to be intimate physically spiritually and emotionally there are a billion sermons on emotional and spiritual growth there are very few on sexual growth yeah. and it is that's why i think it is all the more important to feed yourself purposefully because if you're not intentionally growing and even your understanding and appreciation of your body or the sexual gift that God's given us, it can so easily just fall way down the line in your priority list. And it's fine. There's busy seasons, but it is a gift to be cultivated because it's powerful. And it was meant to build up a marriage that then can be fruitful, multiply and take dominion, do the things God's made us to do on the earth. It happens in those intimate spaces. That's where the juice is. That's where the good stuff grows. So true. Okay. I wish we had more time, but I have one more question and then any resources, anything that you think would be helpful for us, please tell us. But the last question I want to ask is specifically about, I guess, you know, it was asked in a few different ways, but basically, is it possible to have an orgasm through like traditional sex, like the penis and the vagina, just, you know, like you said, like thrusting in and out. Is that even possible? Or is that like, no, that's never going to happen. Tell us the scoop. Okay. Well, again, I'm not a doctor, but from what I know from study and personal experience, it, it is possible. And the reason it would be possible is that the penetration is so deep that it's hitting some pleasure spots. There's the G spot up there. And there are, because the clitoris is not just the tip on the outside, it's connected to a whole host, like tens 10,000 nerve endings throughout your pelvic region. And so you can have an orgasm. Honestly, the truth is you can have an orgasm with him kissing your neck, with him stimulating your nipples, because you can have orgasmic feelings throughout your body that feel powerful and you start contracting in your genitals. 
It is true. Mm -hmm. So there's no, like the sky is the limit with a woman's body because a woman's body is amazing. If you want to know about the penetration, it can feel good. You can feel good feelings. One of the most common ways that you will have an orgasm while having penetrative sex is if your pelvic region or your, um, kind of the pelvic bone is kind of grinding on his body yeah. because you're kind of getting stimulation. Most commonly women will have orgasm through manual stimulation of the clitoris mm -hmm. and either him using hands inside of her or, or, um, his penis inside of yeah. her. And so don't be afraid to use your hands or his hands all the while, like simultaneously because mm -hmm. it just makes it better. It's like all the good stuff happening at one time. Yeah and being able to enjoy that moment. So the answer is really yes, it is all possible, it's all good. It just takes practice and getting to know your body and relaxing and knowing what feels good and exploring your erogenous zones while he's touching you down there. Like it's all sorts of fun to be had, but I think the biggest thing is saying, yay, I can't wait to explore. Instead of like, ah, I'm scared I won't be able to. Yes. Thinking of growth mindset, what's possible? I haven't had this yet, but maybe we can keep trying. Educate yourself on your body because it's good and it is way better than maybe we have been told. Um, God is the author of it. He's the author of pleasure. It's beautiful and it's wonderful. And you uh, were designed to be able to receive good things mm -hmm. from your husband. And so it's, mm -hmm. a good, it's a good gift. Okay, you've left all of us wanting more. So obviously we have your Heaven in Your Home podcast, which is incredible. And you talk about all the things and have so many incredible guests on there. And it's just like, I'm obsessed. But are there any other books, any other podcasts? I know you've mentioned two so far. Anything else that you would recommend for us to dig into? Yeah, I have some challenges on my website. There's the Growing Your Desire Challenge, which helps you get in tune with your five senses in everyday moments. So it's if this is even overwhelming and you want to step back a little bit and really get into your body, that is a really good place to start. Um, I have a Jumpstart Your Marriage Connection course that's to do with your husband, and it's about physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and missional intimacy. And that's a really fun one. In terms of other people's resources, this book is um, kind of old looking. It is old looking because it is old. Do you know who this is? Cliff and Joyce Penner. Yes, yes, they, yes. Okay. Yeah, this one's called Getting Your Sex Life Off to a Great Start, a guide for engaged and newlywed couples. It has so many amazing exercises for some of these things we've talked about, like yeah. self-cultivation, using your mirror. Got so it. I would say between the, these are two of my favorites, the one about Bonnie Burns, Unlike Your Orgasm, okay. and then Getting Your Sex Life Off to a Great Start by the Pinners. So I think those resources will get you going. Oh, that's so great. Thank you so much, Francie, for coming on and just... I mean, this is the definitely the most in-depth conversation we've had on The Girl Defined Show about sex and marriage and intimacy, and I, it just makes me so excited that this conversation is happening and that people are going to find you as a result of this and get to listen to your podcast because it's been such a huge blessing to me. I mean, like literally my sister who just got married three months ago, I <laughs> before she got married, I was like, you have to start in episode one and listen all the way through. And she literally listened to every single one of your episodes. Oh, <laughs> so I am so like cute. assigning it like homework. So thank you so much. I really appreciate the time you've taken to be with us today. Thanks, Bethany.